Because you guys keep asking, here it finally is. The video comparing the 420 that you can record internally on the Sony a7 III versus the 422 that you can record with the Atomos Ninja 5. Let's get undone. What's happening everybody? I'm Gerald Undone and I am a camera with its shutter open. All right, so I have quite a few samples to show you, but I wanted to clear up some confusion that some of your questions have suggested exists. First off, while the Atomos Ninja 5 does feature 10-bit codecs, this does not mean that your Sony will output 10-bit when connected to it. It'll still be 8-bit. The only real difference, other than the obvious advantages to workflow, is the chroma subsampling. So let's take a quick minute to explain the difference between 422 and 420 in theory. So chroma subsampling, as I've explained in other videos, is a way of combining or averaging the color or chroma information without negatively impacting the luma information. More crudely, you keep your brightness intact but lower the color resolution so that you can lower the bandwidth of your video. And this is done because the human eye is more sensitive to variance in luminance than it is to color. So if you're trying to save bandwidth, you're better off lowering the color resolution than you are changing the luma. And the numbers are just a way of indicating how combined or lossy those colors are. If you take a typical 4x2 reference grid and fill it with different values, the the first number is the width of the sampling region, which is four because there's four columns. Then the next number is how many of the four colors of the first row will be preserved or combined. If they're all kept, then you get a four. And the same is true for the second row. If all four colors are kept, then you get another four. So 444 four, four preserves full color resolution. If, however, you combine them into groups of two, well then you'll have 422 two, two if you have two sets of colors on the top row and two sets of colors on the bottom row. But if you combine them further and the top row carries downward onto the bottom row and you just end up with these two big blocks of color, well then you have 420. Two, because you still do have two separate colors, but zero because there's nothing really on the second row, it's just being carried down from the first row. So in theory, this should give you noticeably lower color resolution, which could cause reduced clarity where colors meet and also worsened artifacts. But it doesn't change the amount of colors that are available for that bit depth. 8-bit will still have 255 per channel, regardless of the subsample method used. And so I think a lot of people overrate the impact that this subsampling method will have on color banding. But let's actually see. So I've got some samples for you here that were taken using a mixed light gradient with different luminances and pushed to extremes. Then I went ahead and applied crazy grades to them to see if we could cause banding or other issues in one, but not the other. Now I don't know exactly how this is going to show up on YouTube yet, but if the results are different when I view it online than what I'm seeing here on my screen, I'll let you know in the comments. All right, so as you can see here on the top, we have the external, which is going to be 422 and then on the bottom the internal 420 and I'm going to try and keep that the same throughout most of these tests and uh, this shot as it is right now shows you what it looks like without anything done to it. It's blue, I've got a strong gradient going across and some light and dark areas as well as quite a bit of noise in the bottom that we can zoom in on a little bit later. So just give this one a playthrough and see how it looks. All right, so when I went through the different reds and oranges and purples there, that was extreme grades being applied because it stayed blue the entire time naturally. And I didn't notice a huge difference between them, to be honest with you. There was a couple points where I thought maybe the noise, the, the pixels, the moving pixels actually seemed to be a little bit larger on the internal one. But let's have a closer look. I've got one here now at 400%. We're just gonna punch in and take a closer look at the noise. All right, so I do think that the internals noise is blotchier and larger and more obvious, where the external is finer. It's like more like little dots where the internals kind of like blocks. And that makes sense based on what we just explained the chroma subsampling does with combining of pixels. So you're gonna get larger artifacts, if you will. But as far as the color banding and as far as the preservation of the colors, I still find them to be pretty close despite all this crazy stuff that we're doing to them. Now for this next test here, I have uh, my Rubik's Cube, which I shot with the same light but with dual gradients now. So I have kind of like a white green light coming in against the blue light. And I have them meeting at the Rubik's Cube, which also has strong colors that will hopefully split up the gradient and give it a challenge with trying to mix all these colors together. Now this one's not top and bottom. I'm gonna show you the internal first and the external after, but see if you can even see when it switches. Could you even tell when it switched? And by the way, if you saw that little blinking thing on the bottom square, that's actually the tally light on the Atomos shining onto the Rubik's Cube. You can just ignore it, it has nothing to do with these tests. All right, now I'm gonna apply an extreme grade to this. 
like that. And we're gonna do it again and see, look in the background, see if you can see the banding change at all, see if anything else looks off to you. And again, I'm not gonna tell you when it switches, but it's gonna start with internal and eventually go to external. Again, for me, while watching it, I couldn't even tell when it switched, and I definitely couldn't see a difference in the banding in the background. Now for this next test, I saw this sample online that showed a light being blasted across from white to black, and the difference between 420 and 422 was pretty extreme there in terms of the banding, and they said that they accomplished this just by adding a pretty extreme curve on it. So I tried to recreate that shot and see if I could get the banding to happen as well. Now they were using a GH4 for their test, but I had a lot of trouble recreating that same effect. Now what I did was I shot a light into an umbrella and then faded it across the umbrella and then have a black background. And this is what it looks like with with not much of a grade on it at all. And then if we apply the curve to it, it looks like this. Now that's pretty extreme, but I follow the same curve that that person used. And if I, right now you're looking at the internal version, and if I hide this one, you're gonna see the external version. And I'll bring it back, internal, external. And for good measure, here's another curve that they showed as well that I also tried, that's actually less drastic than the other one. You're looking at the internal now, and there's the external internal, external. And again, the only real difference I see is an increased color noise on the internal when you push it to the extremes. And you know, maybe that's something that's worth something to you if you, you plan on doing some pretty extreme grades and you don't wanna see little green and magenta dancers around your pixels, there, there will be fewer of those if you record using 422. Anyway, I took that guy's extreme curve and then applied it on top of the extreme grade that I already did to the previous light gradient, and I was finally able to produce some banding. But this is two extreme grades stacked on top of each other. But here, take a look at this one. Now there were moments during that test where I saw the internal, when the light was being pushed in out, show a bit more banding than the external. It wasn't huge, it wasn't like the samples that you see online where it's like hard lines versus no lines. It was kind of like, you know, 2% banding on the external and 6 to 8% banding on the internal. But it was there, I did notice a bit of a difference. And also again, that noise, the, the noise is just sort of blockier and bigger and has more like aberration to it. But these are extreme, you, like you, you really gotta understand I put an extreme like broken curve on top of pushing another curve with like the colors all out of whack and then huge changes to the contrast. Basically what I'm trying to say is that if it takes this much effort to get it to show any difference at all between the two, I don't really think that you're gonna notice much of a difference if you're getting the Atomos solely for image quality. Don't get me wrong, there's huge benefits to using the Atomos when it comes to storage options. For instance, SSDs beat the hell out of SD cards and the codecs are easier to edit and will provide smoother performance for your NLE. And it's loaded with features that make shooting easier and more accurate by having a larger screen and great tools and scopes, and you can flip the thing around to see yourself. And if you're doing it for those reasons, then it's a nice little perk that maybe you'll see a tiny reduction in color noise and maybe a 1% increase in sharpness. And if your camera is one that offers a completely different bit depth and subsampling when you're using an external recorder, then that's a different story. Going from 8-bit 420 to 10-bit 422, now that's huge. And in the future firmware upgrade for the Nikon with the 12-bit ProRes RAW, you're gonna see some noticeable gains. But in the case of the Sony, and probably some other cameras, if you're only going from 420 to 422, don't get the Atomos solely for image quality unless you plan on really pushing everything you shoot to the absolute max, and even then you might not notice a difference. But that's going to be it for me. I hope you found this video helpful or at least entertaining. And if you did, make sure you leave it the old thumbs up and consider subscribing if you haven't already. But if you did not find this video helpful or entertaining, feel free to hit the dislike button twice. Alright, I'm done.